So I've already written a few videos about Animal Crossing and the potential psychological and mood benefits it offers players, but today I wanted to talk about what happens when a game that's supposed to be the epitome of cozy gameplay becomes the cause of stress or anxiety. My reviews here on Screen Therapy go beyond analyzing game mechanics or design. I instead focus on what goes on in a player's mind when they interact with the game. Particularly, I focus on positive media psychology and will share with you techniques of positive media literacy that shows us that we can use our favorite games, movies, and other media as tools for mindful mood regulation, self-discovery, and even self-improvement. From the calming scenery to the opportunities for players to explore their self-expression and engage in creative identity play, Animal Crossing New Horizons took the world by storm just as the pandemic hit in 2020 and provided a sweet oasis of positivity and slow, self-paced play that helped millions of people regulate fluctuating emotions in the face of a crisis, as well as opportunities to rest, recover, connect with friends, incorporate play into their routines, and invest in a creative outlet during sudden lockdowns that disrupted daily life. But while I've covered the many benefits of the game, I wanted to make this quick essay about the other side of this Animal Crossing coin, and talk about the millions of players who didn't feel those benefits, and they, in fact, felt worse after playing. With the major update in DLC having been released, we're seeing a resurgence of interest in New Horizons. Players are either returning to the game for new content or downloading it for the first time. While many players are having fun with the expansions, many are logging in and have been immediately overwhelmed by all the possible combinations of decor and landscaping. For these players, their islands have turned from a virtual getaway paradise to a yawning pit of anxiety-inducing possibilities. Many of these players admit they dread logging in every day and usually leave play sessions exhausted and in a worse mood than before starting it up. And strangely, this has been the reality since 2020. Of course, there are lots of players who just felt mildly unsatisfied with the gameplay or found the activities to be more like chores and simply chose to stop playing, but I'm referencing those who experience significant stress from the game and have even come to avoid playing it at all or play it in cycles of binging and burnout. I'll show you how we can adopt positive media literacy skills to be mindful of our relationships with media, even media that stresses us out to learn more about ourselves, our needs, and how to adopt helpful media habits that can ease our stress and help us grow our emotional intelligence. Okay, so diving immediately into the research, I want to bring up self-determination theory. According to self-determination theory, we naturally love playing games because they help us replenish one or more of these three basic psychological needs. This theory isn't only about gaming. These are three psychological needs that we always have to keep fulfilled throughout our daily lives. Gaming, however, is one way to fill up these needs. These needs are feelings of mastery, agency, and connectedness. Mastery is the feeling of competency in our abilities and skills by overcoming challenges. Agency is a feeling of independence in being able to make decisions for ourselves and meaningfully shape the world around us. This can also apply to virtual worlds, like our Animal Crossing island or villages. Connectedness. This is our feeling of being connected to others through social activities. This can be fulfilled through either social activities in person or virtual meetups as well. These three psychological needs are at the center of our mental and emotional well-being and are connected to our moods and emotional health. So how does this relate to stress? Studies have shown that players who are already stressed coming into a game actually feel more stressed if they have too much control or have too many options in the game. It's overwhelming and takes too much energy to manage all the possibilities when the player is already stressed and feeling depleted. What they found was that moderate amounts of options and a moderate sense of control was the best way to boost the mood for all players, stressed or non-stressed, proving that we need a little structure in order to keep ourselves from feeling overwhelmed. This might be something Nintendo knew. In New Leaf and previous Animal Crossing titles, we only had a moderate amount of options and choices to make for our villages. This kept us in a box and kept agency low, but competency high. Now they've opened that box and we can do so much more and our agency, yes, is much higher in this game, but that might lead to lower competency for some players. 
and competency is probably the most popular need that people refill when they play games. So frustrating the need for competency can be a little bit more stressful than if they had frustrated the need for agency. But if we recall that study I brought up, if too many options is bad for players who are already stressed when they come to the game, where is that external stress coming from? And of course, it's different for everyone. Everyone has a different lifestyle and might be experiencing different stressors that make the overwhelming choices and options stressful for them in particular. But I have seen a particular pattern for some players. I think the most detrimental obstacle to our moods when playing Animal Crossing isn't within the game itself. I argue that what really stresses out many of these players before and during gameplay is the combination of social media and Animal Crossing. Unlike any Animal Crossing game before, New Horizons has an online social media presence that is honestly daunting. Of course, I'm not just talking about how Isabel is on Twitter. I mean that so many advanced and extremely dedicated New Horizons players have Twitters, Instagrams, Pinterest, YouTube channels, Twitch streams, and so on. I remember as an avid New Leaf player that there were some codes and pictures online that you could find here and there, but given the game's limited customization options since you couldn't place furniture outside, what I saw on social media wasn't so extreme or intense as some of the absolutely gorgeously curated islands on Instagram and Twitter are now. More than ever before, we're all exposed to the meticulous details of a stranger's island online without ever needing to take a nap in the game to visit them. While sharing our islands on social media is definitely very enjoyable for many players and is of course at the heart of the joy of customizing your island to share them with other people, and, like with the moderate use of any social media, it can offer psychological benefits, such as increased feelings of connectedness with others and the emotional benefits of social sharing and an overall decrease in loneliness. But, for many who haven't had the time, energy, or desire to clock in impressive hours into landscaping or farming bells, and who might also still expect themselves to be extraordinary or exceptional in the game, all of this can take a toll quickly. Interestingly, for many of the players stressed out by Animal Crossing, they may be experiencing a similar burnout that people can feel when they engage with what media psychologists call upward social comparisons, which usually take place on social media. Just like how you might be browsing through Facebook or Instagram and see an old classmate's beautiful home, family, vacations, or exciting lifestyle, you can feel happy for them, but a panic sets in that compared to them, you don't measure up. They, in their perfect social media presence, which is edited for our eyes, always seem to be doing something meaningful or exciting while we're lying on the couch watching our favorite Netflix show for the third time. This panic has many names. I personally love the term status anxiety, coined by philosopher Alain de Baton, which I discussed in a review I wrote about Bong Joon-ho's Parasite, which should be re-uploaded soon. But we've all probably heard of FOMO, the catchy acronym of Fear of Missing Out, which is the feeling that we're not doing everything we could to have all the great experiences we see others having. These negative feelings all tie back to a sense that we just don't measure up with those that we see on social media or with friends in real life. Whatever you call it, it affects most of everyone at some point and it can instill a sense of inadequacy and fear that we're not doing enough. In these instances, media psychologists have discovered that social media's usual benefits are flipped upside down. When you engage in social upward comparisons, instead of feeling more connected to others and less lonely, we actually end up feeling a higher sense of inadequacy, less connected to others, and even lonelier. We feel uniquely lazy and weird for not having the same amazing experiences others share on social media. And it may sound strange, but this exact phenomenon can even happen for a game, like New Horizons. If we value our gaming accomplishments, or if we value being able to express ourselves to others through our digital presence, which is many of us now that we've surrounded ourselves with all these different ways of digital communication and ways to curate digital presences, we can grow to take our digital lives pretty seriously on top of our real lives. 
In this case, we scroll through our feeds and suddenly we see one of those beautiful or interesting islands. The owner of the island has done amazing things with lighting, countertops, walls, cutout boards, partition boards, and it's all so dizzying. We might first feel inspired thinking, well, if they can do it, so can I, or worse, so should I, and boot up our own game just to be greeted by our unfinished projects and lots of empty land with some haphazardly placed paths and fences. Suddenly, the game doesn't feel that fun anymore. It's stressful. Where do we start? Should we put a bridge here or there? And what about inclines? And where should the houses go? What kind of paths should go here or there? This is when we start to feel like there's only one right answer to everything. And that right answer is what decor would help us compete with those creations we saw online, while of course showcasing our own perfect, unique flair. Eventually, we might try to do something and finish the section of our island, but it gets overwhelming fast and we need to take a break. Or we binge play for 10 hours and finish a section, but might not touch the game again for weeks. From then on, if we're not careful, the game can change from being a source of comfort or relaxation to a source of stress, inadequacy, and the paralysis of overwhelming possibilities. It's very easy to get frustrated with yourself for just not being, quote, creative enough or hardworking enough to take the same resources everybody else had and make something just as interesting or impressive. Before I go in to answer how we stop feeling like this when we log into Animal Crossing, quickly I want to answer the obvious question. If it's so stressful, why don't these players just stop playing? Of course, many if not most of them have already stopped. But those who keep playing might still be playing because they spent money on the game and they still want to get their money's worth. Other times it's because they feel as though they shouldn't be stressed out by a game and that it's just something they have to work through. And while I'll argue that yes, you could use Animal Crossing to help muscle through this particular kind of stress, the most likely factor that keeps these players coming back is just how widely popular the game is and might be with their friends. One of the driving forces for how we select any media to interact with is its social utility. As social creatures, we all feel the need to keep up with the social information that pops up around us. When New Horizons took off, trying New Horizons became a social need for many of these players to stay up to date with their friends. This is an automatic reaction to when a piece of media becomes popular. We feel the need to join in so that we can stay included in the conversations our friends are having about it. This motivation is stronger the more our social circles are invested in the piece of media, which could keep us coming back for more even if we don't particularly enjoy it. In light of this information, it might be helpful to examine your motivations to play the game and whether the social benefits of playing outweigh the stress it causes, and come to a mindful decision of whether play is worth the time, energy, and attention it takes from you. If you find yourself comparing your islands to those you see online, it might also be worth your time to examine your habits with social media and whether or not you feel these similar comparisons about real life. Often, our feelings about life simulation games can be microcosms of how we feel about our lives. If you relate to what's described here and know you have a habit of upward social comparisons that make you feel inadequate, maybe by observing your relationship with New Horizons, you can learn more about your inner self as well. By working to accept your island as it is, it might be good practice for accepting yourself in other ways in real life. And that is what it means to live with positive media literacy, to know how to look at our relationships with media and use it as a tool to learn more about ourselves and how to address our emotional or psychological well-being. Mindfulness Tips Here are some tips for how to start mindfully understanding your mood shifts using games like Animal Crossing. When these feelings begin, such as the stress or anxiety, how do you usually react in the game? Do you work very hard trying to make something beautiful until you burn out, or do you feel overwhelmed and start to avoid the game? Just from this, you can start to analyze whether or not you cope with feelings of inadequacy in real life through either perfectionist burnout or avoidance, or possibly a mixture of both. Some might realize that when they compare themselves to someone on social media, they also set up avoidance behaviors to protect themselves, or they might work very hard to gain the same status in real life, but exhaust themselves in the process. Of course, when we think deeply about these things, especially if we already have problems with shame, we can feel silly. We want to judge ourselves for not being able to have fun with a game, 
or judge ourselves for quote, taking it too seriously, or worst of all, judge ourselves in another upward social comparison that we're not as emotionally healthy as other players who have fun with New Horizons. But if we struggle with these feelings, we can relax our self-judgment muscles and recognize instead that these feelings can be very normal, common, and do not reflect anything serious about your character as a person. These feelings are painful and usually follow us through our lives if we don't mindfully take them apart from time to time. But we don't need to add to the pile of shame by being disappointed in ourselves. Really, at the heart of these upward social comparisons and of self-judgment and shame is an aversion to self-compassion. For those who struggle to accept their islands and maybe some aspects of their real lives as worthwhile, meaningful, or beautiful in their own way, even if they're a work in progress, is a fear that being accepted or patient with oneself isn't allowed. To accept our unfinished islands as something to have fun with, instead of a marker of inadequacy, takes a lot of self-compassion. It isn't really necessary for those who are stressed by New Horizons to muscle through it and play it. After all, it is only a game, and we might be better served to save our emotional energy rather than spend it on a game that takes energy away from us. Just coming to that realization might be enough for us. Practicing this mindfulness helps keep our time with New Horizons intentional and focused, and it may help us from overextending ourselves and playing too long until we feel stressed or burnt out. If you struggle with perfectionism and wanting your island to look exactly like the beautiful islands you see on social media, by continuing to play even when your island doesn't feel good enough, you might have success in challenging yourself into accepting that perfection is impossible and that your island, like your life, is worthwhile even without being perfect. Playing Animal Crossing patiently and gently might be a good tool for developing that patience and gentleness towards yourself in real life with your decisions in reality. New Horizons can be a tool to practice living slowly and simply. In essence, this game is helpful for teaching us patience. Just like Rome, those beautiful social media islands weren't built in a day. We can be reminded that progress takes time and that we can't possibly blame ourselves for that. We can learn to understand that there is a difference in resources for players. While we all start with the same situations, no matter what, some players have more real-life resources that allow them to make extravagant islands. They might have resources like time, attention, energy, and motivation to pour into the game. Those who struggle with perfectionism or low self-compassion tend to pressure themselves into being able to do everything anyone can do. But we can slow down and remember that while we can't have 40 hours in our day to do everything we want, that doesn't mean our experience in our game is any less worthy. We can remember the importance of taking the plunge. Many players feel paralyzed by the choices in decorating their islands. They feel as if there's only one right way to live in Animal Crossing and in sometimes also in life. In New Horizons, we can confront the fear of making wrong choices. Expressing ourselves in games like this can be very therapeutic. Little by little, by experimenting with imperfect choices, you can practice accepting that there's no one right way to play or decorate, just as there is no one right way to live. If you never want to pick up New Horizons again, and you know it'll only make you feel awful, but some of these points in this essay rang true to what you were experiencing either in the game or in real life, I'd like to recommend some supplemental learning that has helped me on my journey treating my perfectionism. I recommend looking into Dr. Kristen Neff's resources on selfcompassion.org for the most comprehensive collection of self-compassion practices and information. And if you're well-versed in self-compassion and would like something a little bit more complex and structured, try Dr. Paul Gilbert's compassion-focused therapy techniques to learn more about the skills necessary for accepting ourselves the way we are. My last tip is to remember what it means to just play. Whether that's playing Animal Crossing or anything else, as a child we never graded ourselves by how impressive our imagination was. We had one goal, and that was to have fun. All of us who have learned to live in our heads a little too much could benefit from trying to reconnect with the fun not only in games but in real life as well. Let's give ourselves a break from our worries that we're not good enough and practice forgetting the rubric we put on our lives to measure our accomplishments against others. We can all gift ourselves some time in a game, this one or another one, or in real life, 
to tap into the simple joys of being ourselves just as we are and reclaim some of our energy away from our anxieties. Thank you for watching. If you'd like to see more about video games, movies, mental health, and psychology research, please go ahead and subscribe. Thank you. And as always, happy playing.